Okay, in the, our previous lecture, we talked about um, sort of a high-level view of diffusion, talked about some diffusion mechanisms. Uh, now we want to dive into the mathematics of diffusion. Um, but before we do that, I need to define a few terms for you. So let me give you a, just a, about a four different definitions before we kind of launch into the development of um, the first fundamental equation of diffusion. Okay, so we want to define um, a diffusion flux. Okay, and we usually denote that with uh, the variable J. Okay, and all it is is the number of atoms or mass per unit area. And that's going to be per unit time. So number of atoms or mass per unit area, per unit time, that are uh, crossing a boundary or diffusing across the boundary. Okay, so in 1D, right, that looks like, call it J, is equal to 1 over A, that's per unit area, right, uh, dn dt, right, uh, or we could write that in sort of a difference form as delta N over delta T, right, let's call that equation 1. Next, uh, I want to define concentration, which hopefully is pretty familiar to you. Usually we denote that with the variable C, right? And it's just the number of atoms or mass per unit volume. So we would say that the concentration is equal to N over V, right? Let's call that equation two. A term that we're going to encounter very soon is something called the concentration gradient. Uh, in 1D, uh, it's just del C del X, or if we're not changed, if there's no time dependence, DC, DX, uh, okay? Uh, and then finally, I'll denote the concentration profile. Um, and it's just the, it's just how the concentration varies with space, right? So it's a, it's a plotting the concentration versus spatial location, okay? So the concentration profile of a material is just concentration plotted versus so now I want to pose a question, okay? So we have these terms. Uh, I want to know, to know how are the flux and the concentration related, or are they related, okay? So how are flux and concentration related, okay? So that's, that's what uh, we're gonna, the equation that we're gonna develop is gonna tell us. Um, let, me, let me draw you a picture. So let's go ahead and consider the following scenario. Okay, we're gonna look at, we're gonna assume that we have some cylinder of material. Okay, there, there's my cylinder. I have to use your imagination to imagine it. it looks better than that. And let's go ahead and say this has some cross-sectional area A. We'll define a line right down the center of the cylinder as our coordinate x, so this is 1d, uh, within this cylinder there is a concentration profile given by n as a function of x, okay? Um, now let's consider a boundary here, let's, okay, so there's our boundary. I'm trying to kind of draw a dashed line on the back side. We're interested in how atoms, how, how how atoms diffuse across this boundary defined by this red, okay? So let's, uh, let me, let me draw a few more um, const constructs on this cylinder. Okay, let's, let's suppose that there's a volume here on this, this side and another equivalent. I'm not going to draw the back side of these volumes, okay? Uh, just because it'll get cluttered. Okay, so let's say that this is delta x, and this is the same distance, delta x. So within the volume from this boundary with the black line to the red is some volume A times delta x, and the same volume A times delta x on the other side of the boundary. Okay, and we'll call this location, right, in between the, the, uh, this boundary here and, and the, the um, boundary of interest, we're going to call that point, we'll call it X. And then this point on the halfway in between the other side, we'll call that X plus delta X. 
Okay, this is just kind of setting up the problem. So where red is the boundary of interest. Okay. Okay, here's the fundamental principle that we're going to apply that is that governs uh, all of diffusion. Okay, diffusion arises from what's called a random walk process. Uh, and what's happening there is that atoms are going to be uh, hopping to various um, lattice or interstitial sites depending on the mechanism, and but they're doing it with randomness, right? So they're just if uh, they can move one direction or they can move the other direction with equal probability. Okay, so it's, it arises from a random walk process of atoms hopping to various lattice or interstitial or interstitial sites. Okay. So how do we figure out? What we want to ask is, given some concentration prof profile or some uh, uh, number of atoms profile n, what, what can we say about the, um, the flux of atoms across that boundary? That's the question we're asking, so don't lose sight of that. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to discretize time into steps of delta t. And we're going to suppose that at every time step, all the atoms in this cylinder either move left or they move right, all with equal probability. Okay, so we discretize the time uh, into steps of delta t, and um, suppose that at every time step, uh, atoms um, jump uh, either left. Okay, if they move left, that means they're going to be move a negative delta x, or right which means they'll move a positive delta x with equal probability. So let's think about this. In our, little, in our area here, what that means is we care about what's going to happen to the atoms in this volume defined on the left of the boundary and the volume defined on the right of the boundary. Okay, So here we go. How about the number of atoms crossing the boundary in the positive x direction? Well. We can say that we'll call that delta n plus. So that's how many atoms are going to move in this direction along the x-axis. So how many atoms from this volume defined by a times delta x on the, the left side of this boundary, how many def jump across it? Well, it's got to be half of that number, right? So it'll be equal to 1 half times n of x, right? Call that equation 3. Okay, now how about the number of atoms that are going to cross the other direction? Right, number of atoms uh, crossing the boundary in the negative x direction. So that must be they're moving this way, which means that we care about how many are moving from this volume on the right-hand side now to the left. With equal probability, that means we have a 1 in 2 chance of any atom moving that way. So we would say that we have delta n minus is equal to 1 half times whatever that number in that volume is, which is x plus delta x. Let's call that equation 4. So the net flux of the atoms across the boundary is just going to be however many go positive minus however many go negative, right? So let's write that. So the net flux across the boundary uh, is then given by, call it delta n, is equal to delta n plus minus delta n minus, right? So the net flux will be negative if delta n minus is larger. It'll be positive if delta n plus is larger. So if we just uh, uh, use what we defined in equations 3 and 4, that looks like 1 half times n of x minus n of x plus delta x, right? And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and rearrange this, just flip the sign bring a negative sign out, negative one-half now, times n of x plus delta x minus n of x. Call that equation 5. So now I'm just going to substitute equation 5 into the difference form of the flux that we defined. So into 1, but into the difference form. And we'll say that then j is equal to 1 over a. Remember, this is delta n over delta t. So this is going to be equal to, I'm going to just substitute this in, negative 1 over, let's say, 2 delta t times this quantity here, which now looks like n 
x plus delta x minus n of x divided by a, right? So that's where we're at. Call this equation 6. Well, so now what have we done? Well, let's look at this term, this fraction term. I have a number of atoms divided by the area. If I could somehow get a number of atoms divided by the volume, I have a concentration now, right? So what if I uh, divide by delta x here and multiply by delta x up here? This will give me that volume I need, okay? So I just will say, let's go ahead and observe uh, that by dividing the fraction by delta x, we convert it to a concentration difference. Okay, so if I do that, I end up saying that J equals negative. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna divide by delta x and multiply by delta x to keep everything uh, constant. So this will be negative delta x over two delta t. Now I have uh, this quantity n x plus delta x minus n of x over a delta x right and this quantity here is a volume right and so we can write this as uh, negative delta x over 2 delta t now I have this concentration difference call it the concentration at x plus delta x minus the concentration at x call this equation 7 okay so what I want to try to get to the point is that I, I'm looking at equation 7 and this term here that's in my square brackets looks like I could almost make a derivative out of it if I were to divide by delta x, right, and take the limit as delta x goes to 0. We're not going to say it truly goes to 0, but as it gets small, it becomes a derivative, right? So let's do the same thing again. Let's multiply this by delta x and divide this by delta x, and then we'll convert this to a derivative, okay? So let's say we want to... Uh, write the flux in terms of the concentration gradient. So we're going to go ahead and uh, divide the, that uh, difference by delta x. So we end up with j is equal to, now this has negative, I have to multiply this term by delta x first, right, so I can divide the other one by delta x, 2 delta t. Now I have this quantity c x plus delta x minus c of x, c of x, divided by delta x, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and say for small delta x, which it will be, for small delta x, this becomes negative delta x squared over 2 delta t. And now this becomes uh, partial c with respect to x, right? This is the derivative term. Let's call this equation eight. So what is this saying? This says that the flux, the, the how, how uh, many atoms uh, transport across that boundary in the net uh, is gonna be a function directly proportional to the gradient in the concentration, okay? Uh, so let's think about a little further. What can we say about uh, this? in a solid well you know something about mechanisms now right so in a solid you know that delta x how far an atom jumps in any given time is going to be governed by uh, either the lattice constant or the spacing of the uh, interstitial sites right but it so let's just say that delta x is fixed by the lattice and the atomic arrangement and how about delta t what is delta t delta t corresponds to roughly the time between jumps. On average, this is going to be fixed by the temperature. So both delta x and delta t are going to be fixed for a, a given material at a, at a fixed temperature. Okay, And so that means this quantity, delta x, the quantity squared over 2 delta t, must be something special, right? And it is. This is what the diffusion coefficient is. So we define the diffusion coefficient uh, as follows. We say d is equal to delta x, the quantity squared, divided by 2 delta t. Okay. Let's call this equation 9. 
And then substituting 9 into, into 8 uh, gives the following. It says that J is equal to negative D times del C uh, del X. Okay. This is what is known as fix first law. Okay, we'll call it equation 10. But this is fix first law. Let me give you some closing remarks about fix first law. Okay, number one. You can look and see that above that the units on the diffusion coefficient are, are um, uh, length squared per time. Uh, and typically we're going to report them, if you look them up, in something like meters squared per second. If you want something that's a constant flux, that only happens if the concentration is not changing with time. You're typically going to use fixed first law for concentration gradients that don't vary with time. So, in other words, we call this steady-state diffusion. In a previous lecture, we talked about um, carburization or case hardening, where we where we would put we would diffuse carbon atoms into the iron uh, or steel to to um, change the surface properties. That is not a case of steady-state diffusion. We would not use fixed first law for that because um, obviously, as as carbon diffuses into the iron, the concentration uh, changes, right? So where would we use something like this? Um, this is this is going to be uh, something we're going to use for things like membranes and filtration. So if you want to, let's say, purify hydrogen using a palladium membrane, you're probably going to flow some sort of a gas over the membrane where the gas hydrogen uh, concentration is constant, and as it, it and and then we can talk about how fast it diffuses through the membrane and, and correspondingly how fast that hydrogen is purified. Okay, so let me just mention that. An example where we would use this would be hydrogen purification uh, via a palladium membrane. Okay. In other lectures uh, uh, that are that'll follow here, we'll we'll do some example problems so you'll get a sense for this. Okay. Um, the the final thing I wanted to say is that even though the diff we just showed the diffusion process and the the equations of diffusion. Uh, occurs via random processes, looking at equation 10, you can see why we often still talk about the concentration gradient as the driving force for diffusion, right? Even though it's a random process, we say the concentration gradient is the driving force, okay? So although diffusion is a random process, the concentration gradient is often said to be the driving force, okay? So that's fixed first law. As you might expect, there's a second law coming up, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next lecture.